There we go. It's fine. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chelsea Boudou. I'm the digital content creator for the MSU Science Festival. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Zachary Constant from NSCL and Ephraim. He's going to be talking to you all today about careers in science. Thanks for joining us today, Zach. I'll let you take it from here. Thanks, Chelsea. Uh, great to be back at the Science Festival. Uh, I wish I could see all your lovely faces, but I, I can feel the, you know, the room. It's good. I'm glad you're here. This is, this is what I want to spend my Saturday doing. Believe it or not, this is, this is it. Because I love talking about what we do at FRIB. And uh, we'll have a chance to ask, you know, I want you to ask all the questions about that because it's a big deal. Um, but also like all the cool things that you can do in science. Uh, even if you don't consider yourself a scientist, right? There's a lot of, there's an awful lot. Uh, and so I, I will show you, we're going to start with some slides, da, da, da. but uh, of course you can uh, ask questions through the question and answer uh, window and I'll look for those and I'll try to answer them uh, as, as quickly as possible. Chelsea's here to make sure that I'm paying attention, which is good. I, I could use that. All right, I'm going to share my screen. Of course, the first thing you should know, and uh, this seems pretty obvious, uh, this is an official MSU Science Festival event. Uh, one of the 200 plus, I cannot believe how many, I mean, even in a, in a virtual festival that we still have 200 plus, it's nuts. Uh, it's been a long year. Uh, this is very different from last year, but I love it, love it, love it. It's, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, cool. So. You know, my title of my talk, who will solve the problems? Because this is what science does, it solves problems in a lot of really, really great ways. Uh, and that's what research science careers are. And you can, um, well, let's take a look at the, the, the laboratory. So Michigan State University, uh, I'm betting people who are listening have been, but if you haven't been, it's a really, really giant, it's like a city unto itself, 50,000 students, huge campus. And somewhere on that campus, which is all black and white, I don't know if you know, there's this in color, I'm just kidding, there's this in color uh, uh, building. It's a huge building uh, on Shaw Lane. It's between chemistry on this side and the Wharton Center on this side. That's our big performing arts center. And, um, you know, during normal times when the students are on campus, thousands of students walk by every single day and they have no idea what's going on in there. Uh, I was a graduate student in physics for years at Michigan State University, and I never knew what they were doing. Uh, so it's important to find out. That's why you're here. That's why I'm here. So uh, what we do in that laboratory, the Facility for Rare Isotope Beams, or FRIB, I know it looks like FRIB. It's pronounced FRIB. <laughs> you just have to trust me on this one. But in that building, we study the nucleus of the atom. Of course, here is a model of an atom, is that really what an atom looks like? No, real atoms are not red, white, and blue America. But this is a nice model. It's a nice way to think about an atom. So it's, it's better than nothing. It's called the Bohr model. Uh, you know, Real atoms are not like little planets orbiting a little sun. Uh, but the atom is in fact made of protons, neutrons, electrons. The protons and neutrons at the core form the nucleus. It's the atomic nucleus. And at our laboratory, EFRIB, that's our business. We want to study the nucleus of the atom. I want to make an important point, though. Uh, the, this, one of the real problems with this particular model is that it's out of scale by a long shot. So imagine that an atom was the size of the room that you're in. Okay, so picture that. And now you have to think that the size of the nucleus compared to that atom would be the tip of this arrow right here. That's how small the nucleus is. So whenever you draw an atom, the nucleus should actually be too small for you to see. It's just terrible, you know, it's really hard to get your head around. But so it's important to note, we don't study the atom, which is crazy small to begin with. We study the nucleus, which is, you know, 10,000 times smaller. So the point is, it's hard business. Uh, and why are they interesting? Well. Stuff are made of them. Everything's made of atoms. You know, no matter where you're looking right now, it's atoms. And the center part of the atom is the nucleus. So if you want to understand this stuff, everything you're looking at, everything you see, then you need to understand the nucleus of the atom. 
And that's what we do. So we're studying what stuff is made of and how big are nuclei? We've already established they're very small. How many different kinds are there? There's a lot. How much do they weigh? Not much, I promise you. Why are some radioactive? Fun. And where do new nuclei get made? So this is the sun, of course. And the sun, like other stars, shines because of nuclear reactions. It's taking hydrogen nuclei and fusing them together to make helium. It's actually making new elements. It's making nuclei of a different element. So uh, if you want to understand the sun, if you want to understand the fusion reactions that are occurring to make it shine, you don't want to go there and measure because that's just not safe. So you want to study nuclei in a laboratory like ours, much better. Uh, so there's a lot of really, really important reasons that we want to study nuclei. We have questions. I mean, this is what scientists do. We have a lot of questions. We're trying to figure out what the answers are. Who cares? It's a really important question as well. Why would we bother doing this? I mean, there's got, okay, yeah, I suppose it's nice to know what goes on in the sun and how much the nucleus weighs and that kind of stuff. Okay, uh, but how does it help us? How, what are the applications? What good is it for anybody? This is an important question that needs to be asked up front. Uh, and you know, maybe I don't have to sell science to you. Hey, you attended the MSU Science Festival. But I want you to know why we bother doing this, because then you can tell all your friends. In the end, there's an awful lot of really, really great uses for nuclear science. Uh, we are, of course, trying to understand matter, how stuff works. Well, everything's made of matter. So understanding that helps us do a lot of really interesting and useful things uh, with the research that we do. So we have you know, invented a lot of detectors over the years. Uh, ways to measure the nucleus without looking at it, because you can't. Uh, a good one that you might have heard of is called an MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. That was in initially invented to measure the nucleus, uh, which is something we need to do. And then someone remembered, oh, humans are chock full of nuclei, so we can measure your insides without cutting you open. You're welcome. It's a pretty good deal. I'm very happy about that. Uh, there, there are other, the PET scans. Have you ever had a PET scan? Uh, that's another thing that came straight out of uh, detecting nuclei. That's our business. So by learning how to measure nuclei, we can learn how to measure other things. And of course, we invent accelerators to make the nucleus go fast and break it, which we'll get into in a minute. Uh, you can use the same types of accelerators to shoot particles at a tumor. So you want to kill cancer you can use the same technologies that we've come up with in nuclear science. Pretty nice, okay? So there's a lot of really, really great medical applications, ways to help patients that come straight out of nuclear science. And so that's a good reason to do this kind of work. You might have heard of carbon-14 dating. You know, based on the nuclei in an object, we can tell you how old it is and where it's from, that kind of thing. 20% of the electricity in this country comes from nuclear power just literally breaking nuclei in a facility. Uh, smoke detectors use radioactive material. That's how they detect smoke. That's great. My favorite example of nuclear science uh, is what you're looking at. <laughs> Laptops, smartphones, whatever. You can't build these electronics this small without the last 50 years of basic nuclear research. The things that we've learned in nuclear science have made this stuff possible. Now, if we're trying to learn about the nucleus, are we actually trying to invent a phone? No, but that's what we got, so you're welcome. Yeah, I'm just gonna take credit for it, I can do that. Point is, we study the nucleus for the sake of knowing about it, because we have questions. But the things that we learn become useful in ways that nobody really saw coming. So in the end, what we're really doing with nuclear science is saving lives and changing the world, okay? Who cares? Everybody cares. This matters. And that's why literally the entire country is investing it. We're funded by the U.S. Department of Energy. You can see it down here, U.S. Department of Energy, Office of Science. Um, they're paying us to establish this laboratory and run it. Uh, so we're all paying for it with our taxes. Why? Because it's gonna make a difference. And so we're all gonna invest in nuclear science and it's gonna help us down the, down the road. It's gonna be great. So, and it always has, that's why we keep doing it. That's who cares, we do. Now, now that you're convinced, we wanna do nuclear science. 
uh, it's really difficult. <laughs> For instance, you can't see the nucleus ever, so it's very difficult to measure. Plus the nuclei that we study at Ephraim, like we're not gonna study any old nuclei. Psh, no, fine. I mean, you guys have tons, uh, but we wanna study particular nuclei that are radioactive, exist for less than one second. Oh, yay. And you won't find them on this planet. Goody. Okay. Uh, there are laboratories that'll study, you know, more normal stuff, but we're really interested in nuclei that uh, are not accessible on this planet. So how are we going to do it? It takes an incredible team. That's really it. It's the people. Uh, and when people ask me what my favorite job, my favorite part of my job is, it's working with awesome people because at EFRIB, we have over 800 employees, huge team, lots and lots of different skill sets and specialties. And together, uh, we make it possible to do things no one has ever done in the history of humanity, right? Uh, it is great being a part of that endeavor. So I'm going to tell you a lot more about the kinds of things these people do, but it is uh, really uh, a lot of different backgrounds. It's amazing. Uh, where these people come from. Uh, our, our current staff, let's see, uh, let's see, one of them used to drive a backhoe, one of them used to fix helicopters, uh, a lot of them used to work in the auto industry, building cars. Uh, one of them who retired not long ago was a farmer, and then he joined our lab and started running accelerators. <laughs> Michigan State University, we're a farm school, and so yeah, we do these things. Okay, so fun bunch, fun bunch. Now, how do we actually do what we do? Uh, this is our laboratory, uh, actually, as it was a few years ago. Uh, we have been the National Superconducting Cyclotron Laboratory for decades. Uh, we have cyclotrons. So when people think about us and talk about us on campus, they're like, oh, the cyclotron lab. Okay, and that's been okay, because we have cyclotrons. And they're, let's see, right here. This one's 10 feet wide, uh, 14 feet wide both five stories tall, okay? Lovely accelerators. And uh, what we've been using them to do uh, is make rare nuclei. In this room, one room, 450 feet long, football field and a half. That's where we've been doing our research. This laboratory, uh, you know, as, as it stood, was top three in the entire world for studying rare radioactive nuclei. Top three in the world. Is that good enough? you know it's not good enough. There's no such thing as good enough in science, come on. So uh, we have always been improving, always changing the laboratory. If you've been around campus for any length of time, you might've noticed there's a lot of construction going on at this site, always, because there's always something new to do and we need to improve so we can do it. But uh, the big one, <laughs> the big improvement has been going on for the last decade or so. Uh, gosh, so here's what happened. We won this project, Facility for Rare Isotope Beams, EFRIB. We're changing our name. We can't be called the Cyclotron anymore. We're gonna be EFRIB because with this $730 million, we are replacing the Cyclotrons. Two of the best Cyclotrons in the world, not good enough anymore. And we're building instead a linear accelerator, 400 yards long, 35 feet underground. Clearly a lot bigger than the Cyclotrons were. This new accelerator, basically it's gonna start your nuclei here, some stable boring nuclei. It's gonna accelerate them down this pipe. They're gonna be going pretty fast. Then they'll turn around, they're gonna accelerate again, go even faster, turn around, accelerate again. When they get to this point right here, they're gonna hit a target. Yeah, that target's just a chunk of carbon. And so I have stable common nuclei coming down at half the speed of light at this point. Uh, that's equivalent to four times around the earth per second. Not bad. So my nucleus is coming down and I'll show you what actually happens. I just can't talk about nuclei without toys. Uh, if you know physicists, we love toys. So this particular nucleus has yellow protons and green neutrons. And it's a normal nucleus because it has six of each. That makes it a carbon 12 nucleus. Uh, you yourself are carbon based. 99% of the carbon in your body, carbon-12. Uh, stable, common, boring. Not you, carbon-12. We don't wanna study this kind of nucleus. We wanna study rare radioactive ones. So the way we're gonna do it 
is get them going half the speed of light. And when they collide with the, uh, the target, uh, basically what happens is if I threw this against the wall, and I'm not going to, just pretend with me. If I threw it against the wall, it would knock off some combination of protons and neutrons. So what's left? Oh, wow, this is good. Something very different. Literally, if you can knock off some protons and neutrons, you can change the nucleus, you can make something new. I only have two protons left. So that makes this a helium nucleus. I had a carbon, I broke it, I made a helium. If you've ever heard of alchemy, that's literally what we do at our lab. We change elements 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's our business. We can turn lead into gold. I actually did the math. To make an ounce of gold would take our laboratory one trillion years at a cost of 20 quintillion dollars. So just, I don't want you to get the idea that you can make money with this. Okay, I got a helium nucleus. I also have four neutrons. Four plus two is six. This is a helium six. Carbon-12 was stable and common and boring. I have made a radioactive helium-6. This exists on average for less than a second. This is good stuff. This is honestly what we want to study at effort. So by hitting it into the target really, really hard, uh, we break the nucleus and we make, hopefully, rare, interesting radioactive nuclei. We uh, bring them up out of the tunnel and connect with all the detectors, all the things we use to measure nuclei, which we've been using for decades and they're still there and we can connect with them. So we're just bypassing the cyclotron, got this new awesome uh, accelerator and that's gonna do the job. Uh, what's great about this accelerator for effort? Number one, it's twice the energy. It's literally hitting twice as hard. Uh, not twice as fast, twice as hard, it's, it's complicated. But more importantly, this accelerator is gonna smash hundreds of times as many nuclei per second as the cyclotrons could. By smashing more nuclei, you're going to get more of the interesting rare radioactive nuclei that you want. And because you do it so many, you will be able to produce some nuclei that nobody's ever seen. We are going to discover a lot of new nuclei with this facility. There are only about 3,000 or so known types of nuclei. Um, that's not elements, it's types of nuclei. It's a long story, but trust me. Uh, this particular facility is expected to discover at least a thousand new ones. That's huge. That's a lot of them. And let me tell you, the last time we discovered a new nucleus in this facility, we all got free pizza. Okay, FRIB is going to be like a thousand free pizzas, which they're going to have to cut us off because there's no way. The point is, uh, it's going to smash more. It's going to smash harder. It's going to let us do experiments nobody else on Earth can do. It's going to make us the world leading rare isotope facility, bar none, right? So top three in the world, not good enough. We're gonna be the best by 2022. Hey, next year, basically less than 12 months from now, we should be running this accelerator and doing the best research in the world for this kind of stuff, um, for this kind of stuff, right? You know, we're not doing what the LHC does at CERN. They do even smaller stuff. They're studying quarks and gluons, the stuff inside protons and neutrons. They don't study whole nuclei. So um, for our purposes, for our kind of work, best in the world, that's what's coming. At Michigan State University of all things, right? We're good at a lot of stuff. Basketball, ice cream, and this are probably the most important. So uh, that's what's coming and it's an exciting thing. But again, oh, how's all this gonna you know, get here? <laughs> Where will EFRIB come from? We have 800 some people and they're literally building it, right? Uh, right now, you're not going to buy these accelerators at Home Depot. I checked. So we have people who literally invent the equipment, R&D. They're creative. They're like, okay, let's make something nobody's ever made to do things nobody's ever done. And then we have mechanical designers and engineers are like, yeah, okay. Uh, how can we make that work and fit and do what it needs to do? Okay, machinists, let's carve the parts. Let's assemble them. Let's weld them together and cool them down and power them up. Uh, so do we need nuclear scientists? Pretty obviously. <laughs> They're the ones doing the research. And we have about 40 faculty researchers in our lab. There's over 200 students working in that laboratory, many of whom are learning to be nuclear scientists. But uh, here's a good comparison. The, uh, imagine an aircraft carrier, 
right? The purpose of an aircraft carrier is to get the planes where they need to go. Well, how many people on that aircraft carrier are pilots? You know, the actual flight, not that many, right? We don't have that many researchers, really. Um, everybody else supports and makes it possible for the, that pilot to get that plane where it's supposed to be. All these people are making it possible to do research no one has ever done in the history of humanity. Uh, and that's what it takes. And really, if it's STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, or skilled trades, we're doing it, probably. Uh, it's, uh, you know, we, we've got all kinds of engineering I've never heard of before, and chemists, and, you know, welding and machining. It's an incredible team. Again, lots and lots of different skill sets. Together, they make it work. Uh, so this is just amusing to me. <laughs> I, want, I like to point out to people that scientists don't necessarily look the way they think, okay? Uh, and the way I do that with uh, student groups especially is I like to show this picture and say, well, you know, which of this, these groups of people are not scientists? Uh, and of all the people you're looking at in this picture, uh, it's, it's A. <laughs> it's the people in the white coats and, the, and all that equipment. They're just wearing a bunch of safety stuff. They're high school students from one of my camps a couple years ago. I dressed them up. The, what I want people to recognize is that um, not only do we have a really broad range of people, uh, but they're not what you who expect to be, right? You, you're not, uh, people often get this, this picture, especially uh, it's, it's given to them by, uh, you know, the media, movies and things. And they're like, okay, yeah, it's, it's a bunch of old white dudes in lab coats. No. Okay, and it's important to recognize that. It's all these people. I mean, they can be scientists. They just need to graduate first or something. But all these other people are doing science. Hey, it's me. Great. Okay. So moving on. Uh, so I love to do a little game show. Unfortunately, I can't see you. You can't, you know, I, I you can't have you actually. So I'm going to open the doors for you. Okay. Uh, so just imagine that you're on a game show and, uh, you know, what's behind door number four? Uh, and really, all these doors are like different things you might be doing in science. And it's different. One of my favorite things about science, it, it is always new. It, you're doing something different every day. Uh, for instance, on some days, you're going to be programming. Uh, because there's a lot of things you don't want to have to do yourself. Make the computer do it for you. That makes a lot of sense. Or, oops, oh, there you go. Or you got to be studying. <laughs> when I do this with students, you know, and somebody picks door one and they're like, oh, study, oh, God. But honestly, if you're trying to learn things nobody's ever learned, you have to look at what other people have done. <laughs> Why has this not been done before? What, what are they doing wrong? How can we improve on that? You got to figure out what they've been doing. Uh, what else? You got to build equipment. <laughs> Obviously, it needs to be done, you know, because, uh, you know, trying to solve problems, uh, you've got to come up with entirely new solutions. Uh, you might want to design that equipment first. <laughs> Always a good idea. And what else? Then, of course, you want to have to work with an incredible team. So uh, being a scientist means collaborating. And this is a really important point. Because uh, if you've seen The Big Bang Theory, it's a TV show, it's very funny. Uh, uh, I enjoy it. Uh, but it's important to recognize the stereotypes and where they go wrong. Because... Uh, some of the scientists, you know, for instance, Sheldon Cooper on that show, uh, not really good at working with other people. Uh, but as a scientist, you really have to be. You, you're not a lone wolf. You've got to be able to do it yourself, uh, you know, with other people, right? So um, it's, it's very important to know. Uh, what else could you do? Uh, you're going to be writing things down. Uh, there's a lot of writing and communicating, uh, obviously, with the other people, but like, you also have to come up with a way to express and share it, what you've learned. If you don't, you know, what good is it that you learned that thing? It's got to be uh, shared with other people. Uh, and that's another reason we have the MSU Science Festival. But anyway, all these different things, every day is different and it's, and it's exciting. And of course, uh, you combine all this stuff and you will discover the mysteries of the universe and get fabulous prizes. It's a game show, I told you. Anyway. I just like that, you know, being, having a career in science, not just being a scientist, but in science, uh, it's different every day. 
And you can have jobs that where you're doing exactly the same thing every day, all the time. That does not say, sound particularly exciting to me. So I love it. Now, science takes you places, uh, literally and figuratively. So when you have a degree and you've learned things about science, especially physics, but there's a lot of good sciences. Uh, these are the kinds of things you learn how to do. Design and build your equipment. You know, where's it going to come from, by the way? Program things. Make the computer solve your problems. Uh, think logically. Oh, that'd be nice. Work with other people. I mentioned that. Solve problems. This is what we need people to do. Um, that's what you're doing in science. And with this skill set, with these kinds of things that you can do, uh, what kinds of jobs could you have? You know, what kind of careers could you go? Well, people often assume you know, the teaching and the research. But you could also be a lawyer or a doctor or you know, pick your favorite, essentially. Uh, my friends, who and we, there are good statistics to show this, people I know with degrees in science have gone on and do pretty much whatever they want. Uh, one of my good friends, we majored in physics together in college, is currently an astronaut. There you go. And so, like, was he, did he want to be an astronaut? Yeah, actually. Uh, but, like, his physics skills were really important to NASA, so they hired him, right? And I have friends who work on Wall Street now uh, just because they were really good at managing big data sets and modeling big, complicated systems like the stock market, I guess. Uh, I've got friends who are working in, in the medical field, uh, both running medical cyclotrons and, uh, you know, basically, again, managing big data sets and figuring out how can we care, take care of the patients if, effectively. Um, you know, they do all kinds of things because this is what people need in jobs. Uh, one of my favorite statistics of all time, the unemployment rate for astrophysicists is zero. They all have jobs. Now, are they all doing astrophysics? No way. <laughs> there aren't that many jobs in astrophysics. But again, their skill set is highly valued by a lot of different careers. And so they've gone on to do all kinds of things. Uh, it's important to note, uh, this kind of is hinting at something. Just because you major in something, right, and you learn about, about something, that does not lock you into a specific job. It's not linear. It's an incredible branching, it's a tree. Uh, essentially, you know, learning science helps you do lots of different kinds of things. We'll talk more about that. Uh, this is a really good example, though. Uh, to go to law school or medical school, you have to take a test. Uh, if you want to get into those schools, you have to score well. Guess who scored second highest on both of the law and medicine tests? Physics majors. Anyway, it's and okay, but here's the thing: people went to college and majored in pre-med. Literally, they're majoring in I want to go to medical school. Here's their scores down here. Here's the pre-law down here. Okay. The skills you pick up in physics and the way that physics teaches you how to learn, how to think. And this is true of lots of sciences. It helps you do what you want to do in lots of weird ways. So I just like to point it out. I, you know, again, I know this from the statistics and from the examples of friends I have. Uh, you can do almost anything you want with this kind of work. Uh, there's a really great thing called Career Pathways by Society of Physics Students. Recommended. Take a look at it. It's pretty cool. Uh, now with science, uh, like you said, you can do a lot of things. Uh, so people who go to college and learn about STEM, these, you know, they basically have a better chance of having a job, which is great because they have skills that are in, in demand and they get paid well for that, which is always nice. Uh, and like I said, you have a lot of choices. It doesn't lock you into something. Your major doesn't determine your career, important to remember. So uh, because you have a lot of choices with this skill set, you're generally happier with what you're doing because you had a choice. You didn't just have to pick the first job that came along. Uh, you could look around and decide for yourself. Uh, that is a great thing. And that's you know what I want people to have uh, is satisfaction in their job. Plus, of course, if you're learning things in STEM fields, you often get to play with big toys. This is just one of our detectors. Three stories tall, 300 tons. I like showing it off. So here we are. All right. Ooh, this is a great one. 
uh, another good example. I mean, people do ask. I, I meet with a lot of uh, you know students, a lot of classrooms, and a common question is like, so what? How does it pay? And they're being very practical, and I appreciate that. Um, and so you know, here's starting salaries for you know, people with a degree in physics, a bachelor's degree, uh, lots doing lots of different things. But probably even more important than the the salaries is the fact that you know, look at the way these people are distributed. Some of them are teaching. Uh, some are in the military. Some are doing research in a lab. Uh, some are doing probably doing research in the private sector. But some are in the private sector doing non-STEM work. It's not even related to STEM anymore. And they're doing it because they can. I just love to point that out. So again, the statistics to back it up. Because in the end, uh, you know, you're learning science, you're learning how to solve problems. And uh, there are a lot of great jobs for people who can solve problems. Um, just reiterating, you can see the message comes back and again, again and again. But, uh, you know, as, as nice as it is to have a job and be happy with the job and get paid well in the job, uh, I think the, probably the most important thing is how are you helping people in your job? Uh, you're solving problems, right? Well, science has incredible potential to solve humanity's problems because we have a lot of them, right? Right now, we can't, you know, go hang out with other people because uh, of so many, you know, there's a pandemic, you've noticed. So how are we going to deal with that? Well, we have so many different scientists working on this from so many different angles. Vaccines, you bet, but also ways to treat it, uh, ways to prevent catching it. You know, uh, right now they're doing all kinds of cool things at my laboratory, uh, you know, putting stuff in the, the ventilation system, uh, ultraviolet emitters to basically kill off virus in the air. Okay. Somebody figured that out and somebody designed a system that you could slide into their ventilation, you know, shaft. So it's amazing. It's amazing. Um, who's going to help feed the world? Who's going to, you know, stop climate change, that kind of stuff. These are important things that need to be done. And uh, that's a good reason to go on science, if you ask me, uh, because it's going to solve a lot. Uh, I just love this story. I got to share it. So when the Apollo missions were going up, uh, there was a nun, I cannot remember where she's from, but she sent a letter to the head of the Apollo program. And she basically said, why are we spending all this money putting people on the moon when we have a lot of hungry people here and we could spend that money to feed them? And, you know, that's a really good question. And he wrote back. Uh, I have a copy of this letter on my wall in my laboratory. Uh, and the, the, what he said was, I, I agree. We have a lot of problems. We need to solve them. And in the process of doing things we've never done before, putting people on the moon, we have discovered solutions and ideas that we never would have thought of, you know, just trying to figure out how to feed people. But you know, seriously, uh, the work that they did with the Apollo program led to solutions that helped them increase crop yields in you know, entirely new ways. That was the exciting thing. So again, uh, just like we do with nuclear science, we learn things about the universe and how it works and how to do amazing new things. And those solutions end up uh, solving problems in exciting new ways, uh, ways that we wouldn't have pursued otherwise. Uh, so that's, that's what science does for us. That's what it can do. It is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Uh, now, of course, you know, going to college, getting a degree, and you can do a lot of great things. But uh, if, if you're really interested in the science, you might choose to stick around and, and get an advanced degree, master's or PhD. One of the nice things about having advanced degrees in science is of course, you know more things <laughs> and therefore you can do more things. Uh, and because there's not so many people out there uh, who have reached that level, there's less competition. Uh, there's just not that many people available to do this kind of work, which means they gotta pay you more, <laughs> which is true. That's, that's one of the nice things about careers in science. Uh, you know, it's, it's just the more you know, the more qualified you are, uh, the more valuable you are. And of course, uh, in advance, when you're working on advanced degrees, you could be doing research uh, all the time. Uh, just here's some examples of the kinds of subfields in physics that you might you know, do some research in. Uh, my research was acoustics when I was in grad school. So I learned about sound. That's cool. Other people learn about string theory. Do not ask me about string theory. I do not know anything. 
Okay. But uh, there's all kinds, there's so many different kinds of things because it's a big universe. There's a lot to learn. And that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. Okay. So we're talking about careers in science, not just scientists, but like all the things that together work for science. And let's imagine that uh, you actually want to do these kinds of things. You know, I mean, I'm really here recruiting. I'm looking for people to do this stuff and change, you know, change the world. It's going to be great. Uh, you know, so maybe you're not ready. I don't know. Depending on who's listening, I can't see you. Uh, maybe you are ready. But here's the thing. No matter where you are now in your life, uh, the 800 some people who work at our laboratory, when they were in a similar place to you, they weren't probably thinking about a laboratory like ours. They weren't thinking about what opportunities are there in, in that kind of environment. Uh, very few people do, uh, but they're there now. They weren't necessarily expecting to work there, but now they're solving the problems and making it possible to learn, you know, discover new nuclei that nobody's ever seen. So how do people get there? Now, if we got any students here, learn stuff. <laughs> You're in school, you might as well. Math, science, computers, pretty obvious. Those are the kinds of things you should want to learn about because uh, we need them all. But those aren't the only things we need. Uh, like I said, you have to be able to communicate your results. You need to be able to work with other people. That means speech class, English class. No kidding. Uh, these are the skill sets that are necessary to do this kind of work. Uh, so uh, make sure that you learn how to do that as well. And um, if you're trying to do things nobody's ever done, we need creative people. And a great way to develop your creativity is arts. So don't neglect the arts. You know, pick up an instrument, dance or do theater or, or paint or something. You develop your creative side because you're going to need it in order to solve these problems. Uh, outside of school, there's a lot of things you can do. Summer camps. We have uh, camps from middle school. We have high school. We got, uh, there's actually some from elementary. So uh, if you know kids, if you are kids or you know kids who are interested in this kind of stuff, there's a website there. Uh, you can find out all the different things. But we do have nuclear science programs in the summer for all kinds of kids. Uh, and we love that. And, you know, outside of that, of course, there's internships, trying to find out more about things. Or maybe your school has science clubs or teams. You can, you can find out more about what's in science, right, outside the classroom. There's job shadowing. And then, of course, uh, what's exciting is that right now we have more access to information than anybody in the history of humanity because we have the libraries and internet and all that stuff. So if you're interested in nuclear science or some other science, look it up. It's out there, okay? And you know, if you're a student who's looking to get into college, uh, they love to hear about this stuff. They love to hear that you're out there looking at what's available, what are the opportunities, you're seeking it out. They wanna hear about that. So put it into your application. Trust me. Now, of course, uh, you go to college and it, of course it helps to have all these things, right? Job and more pay, more pay and everything. Uh, STEM fields, just more of everything, which is great. Uh, I already said all that pretty much. Uh, so this is the point that I wanna make. Um, no matter who you are and the kinds of things you're good at, um, these are the things that we need and I bet you can find yourself on this list. We need people who know useful things, design and make things, creative and innovative, like I said, uh, unique people. Well, I guarantee you are unique to yourself. Uh, we need people who like trying new things because uh, we're trying to solve new problems, can work with other people, excited about what they're doing. Uh, you know, Don't quit when it gets tough because uh, there's a reason that research science is tough. Nobody's ever done it before. We need problem solvers, okay? We have uh, a lot of students who are hopefully going to, you know, carry on and learn about their opportunities because who could be working in this? You, really. That's the point I'm trying to make because uh, I guarantee you have this skill set, at least some of it. And it takes all kinds together making it work. So there you go. A couple of uh, encouragements. This is me encouraging you. You can tell. Uh, for instance, I'm talking about jobs you never heard of. And like, there's plenty that I've never heard of. So how do you prepare yourself to do things you don't even know exist, right? 
uh, like, what if you, you know, get to the point in your, your life and you're like, oh, here's a new career that I, sounds exciting, but, uh, you know, I wasn't consciously preparing for it. Well, really just, you want to learn as much as you can. That's really important. So, you know, obviously you can't learn everything, sorry, but, you know, take the opportunities you get to learn as much as you can. Never say, oh, I don't need to know that because I'm never going to need it. How do you know? People change jobs all the time and there's a lot of jobs you don't know of. So, you know, you can't say for sure you're not going to need it. Learn it as much as you can. And also, of course, this is a really important part of being in science is sticking with it, not giving up when it gets hard. Um, it's We're trying to do things nobody's ever done. It's difficult. And uh, really, it, what matters most is, you know, that you keep at it, that you like it enough to keep at it. So an example, when I got to Michigan State University for a graduate school in physics, uh, basically there was a big test you have to take. It's called the candidacy. So you have to pass this test uh, if you want to continue on and get your PhD. Uh, I studied my first year, took all my classes, studied really, really hard. I took that test and I failed. I felt like I didn't belong. I felt like I wasn't good enough. I felt like everybody else knew what they were doing and I didn't. I felt like I should quit. Uh, you ever heard of imposter syndrome? I'm willing to bet that almost everybody has it at some point. It, and it basically means uh, you think uh, you're not good enough. And you know, all those things I just said, basically. Uh, so I had a crisis of confidence. I didn't feel like I was good enough to do this and I should walk away. Uh, but I had a lot of friends and family who encouraged me. And they said, you know, Zach, you really love this stuff. You're excited about it. Don't give up on it. You can take the test again. So try again. And of course, I spent all summer studying again. And I took the test again and I passed. Now, I wouldn't tell you this story if it didn't have a happy ending. I'll admit. But if I had walked away when I felt down about myself, I would not be here talking to you. And this is what I want to do. So uh, it's, you know, it's really important that you find something you're excited about enough to keep at it, even though it gets kind of difficult. Uh, that said, it's okay to change what you're doing, find something that's more exciting. Highly recommend it. But really, my best advice is if you want to, you know, change the world for the better and have a good time doing it, uh, find a science you love and go after it. My best advice. A couple of advertisements here. Uh, our laboratory does really cool work and, our, you know, we want to make sure you know about it because, again, we're all paying for it with our taxes. So uh, I give talks, of course, but we have lots and lots of different ways to do this. If you go to this website right here at the bottom, or right here, we have an awful lot of, you know, YouTube videos you can watch, uh, activities you can download and try. We have a link to our video game, Isotopolis. If you want to smash your own nuclei, make rare radioactive ones on your phone or tablet, you can do that. Uh, we have links to our summer camps and all the kinds of things that we do. Uh, we just, we want to share with you because we're excited about it. And we want you to be excited about it. It's amazing stuff. It's already world-class and it's gonna be the best research in the world uh, for this kind of work. So um, I just want you to know. And if you ever wanna email me, this is my email address, visits at fribmsu. I can't even say it, fribmsu.edu. I give virtual tours right now. Uh, I give talks, I run activities. Uh, you know, We just have lots and lots of ways uh, to help people. So if you know people wanna learn, uh, you know, you want to know people who want to meet some researchers. I got them and I've got access to them uh, and they love talking about what they do. So, you know, advertising, you know, if, if you're interested, if you know somebody's interested, please point them out uh, and we would love to help you. Uh, and that's, you know, that's my show, but I can answer questions as long as you have questions. And I look forward to it. Thank you so much, Dr. Constant. I know that we have some people on Facebook and that's a little bit delayed. So while people are writing questions um, for those on Zoom, please use the Q&A function on Zoom and those on Facebook, please write your questions on the comments. But in the meantime, so 
like we're saying, it's very hard to navigate all of this during the pandemic. And there are so many different fields out there. If you are a young adult, like let's say in middle school or high school, it's a very overwhelming time. Like I was undecided in my first year of college. So I still didn't even know what I want to do when I was in college. How do you have any recommendations for those that are still trying to find themselves? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, you know, it's tricky. My kids are around that age and, you know, I, for me, the secret is just show them as much as you can. And, it, and sometimes it's just, here's a really cool YouTube video I found of, you know, the per- Perseverance Rover, or, you know, here is, uh, here's a cool event at the SU Science Festival that I thought you should see. You know, I want them to, to experience as much as they can so they can find, is, is there something that kind of s- sparks their interest, whatever it is. Uh, the festival obviously is a really great way to do that. Uh, but, you know, these people, all the people who are doing this now, you know, show, doing shows and things, yeah, at the end of April, we don't disappear. Uh, take advantage of the fact that, you know, MSU is this great resource and all these people are doing great stuff. If you're at least, you know, somewhat interested, you know, like, well, would I, is this something I want to pursue? You know, find somebody who's doing it and ask, you know, to, to learn more. Uh, and people, you know, one of the great things about people at MSU is that they're you know, excited about their work and they're happy to share. Uh, and, you know, that's why we have 200 some events at the Science Festival. But yeah, so don't, don't be shy. You know, you can, you can look things up on the internet and stuff like that. But, and there's lots of good resources. Uh, but, you know, keep your eyes open and ask, don't, you know, ask anybody at MSU. Yeah, a lot of people actually don't realize, especially in high school, that with their parents' permission, that they can even volunteer in labs and be involved and even do like things like virtually now, like data analysis and understand what it's like in an academic setting. Like that's not something I knew when I was younger. I didn't realize I can even join a lab till like my second or third year of college. So it took me a while to navigate it through. And um, I wish that more people had these resources and hopefully these students out there are seeing these different talks by the science festival and learning about the different possibilities that they can do from entomology to physics. (laughs) Um, Let's see what else. So I see that you also have Isotopolis. And for those of you that haven't played it, it's a very wonderful game and it's actually like something fun to do while you're learning. So um, something that a lot of people don't really associate learning with is fun. So that's something that I actually personally enjoy. Um, So with these youth programs in the summer, I know about a few of them, but could you explain Mm -hmm. like how they would be in the summer now, especially during the pandemic? Sure. Uh, So the, all the people who do youth programs at MSU have done a great job of adapting and finding new ways to reach the students in the summer. Uh, So we have, we're doing several virtual programs. I'll be involved with a lot of them this summer. Uh, and they're, you know, they're trying different ways. Some of them are on Zoom. Some of them are going to be with other tools. Some of them, they're going to ship you materials and you can do stuff at home, maybe playing along with uh, somebody over Zoom, uh, that kind of thing. Um, for you know, my program, I'm expecting us uh, to be using uh, probably Gather. It's, it, lo- it looks like you're playing Legend of Zelda, like the old version. Uh, and you're just kind of moving around and, and interacting with people. Um, it, it, and we're just trying to look for ways to connect, again, students with the researchers, the people who are actually doing that work, uh, and give the students a chance to, you know, do something that they would in research. Now, when they're on campus, you know, we do some little experiments in a laboratory. They don't get to use the ephorbic solver. That's definitely out of the question. But uh, with the you know the online programs, we have lots and lots of activities that uh, you know. I mean, we have the simple ones where we can say, okay, you're going to make a model nucleus and you're going to smash it and that kind of thing. But uh, our researchers have actually come up with lots of ways that students could model a nucleus, analyze data, and you know try to uh, try to replicate an experiment uh, uh, you know, at home over the computer probably with a team of other students, uh, getting help from a mentor. You know, we're trying to give you the chance to live the scientist's life for a week and see if you like it. Again, that's just what we want to do is ex- expose you to new ideas, new opportunities, 
and see if that's something that clicks. Maybe you want to carry on with it. Maybe you see something else you want to try. That's fine. Uh, but it's, you know, we've, people have gotten really creative. It forces you, right, to be creative. And uh, that's why this is actually kind of an exciting time. Uh, and of course, our, our guests here today, they could be anywhere. It doesn't matter where they are, uh, you know, <laughs> as long as they can connect to the internet. And so um, having these online programs means that they don't have to travel, uh, that they can do it from the comfort of their own homes uh, and, you know, tune in a few hours a day uh, and we can still manage to give them a really great experience. So I'm pretty excited about that. Yeah, it sounds really exciting. I wish I had those opportunities when I was younger, though I do know that your programs are very fun to even volunteer for over the summer too. So mm -hmm. we get to live a little vicariously whenever we volunteer. Um, also, I do want to also reiterate that the Impression 5 exhibit that they have mm -hmm. over there called Smash is amazing. That There are really cool interactive things that you can do to also feel like you are also experiencing that physics and getting to have that tactile experience and with the, with the exhibit and be so interactive. It's a lot of fun. Um, yeah. but I see that we're running out of time now. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Constant, for joining us today for the MSU Science Festival and for your other presentations as well. We've truly enjoyed having you. And for everyone else that are listening, please keep tuning in. We have more talks for the rest of the day and even for the rest of the month. So have a wonderful weekend, everyone. And thanks for joining. Thanks. Good to see you. <laughs> Bye.